Hello, just a quick 15 minute video about the App Builder project that I recently released. The problem that App Builder solves is something that I think every operation team comes across, and that is that our tools have grown tremendously in features and flags and capabilities. Here's a good example from uh, KubeCuddle. You know, and this is not a criticism of KubeCuddle, these things are necessary, but you can see that you know there's there's commands, there's lectures, there's custom formats. Here they use JSON path to select specific data. Um, you can format the output. You know here they're passing things through JQ to turn you know to get the kind of data you want. No one can remember these commands at two in the morning when there's an outage. And you know not to to show it's not just. Um, you know, problem for KubeCuddle, you know, here's Corea, which I make, exact same problem. Too many flags, JSON data, pipe the things with JQ, um, no one's going to remember these commands. Um, on the other spectrum, you have not enough. So, you know, you're new on your team, someone tells you to do an upgrade of your service, and they say, oh yeah, just use upgrade with SH. What's going to happen when I run it? Can I type help? Maybe it just upgrades the service without prompting. Maybe it's not good enough. Or maybe it wants an argument like that. And hopefully if you don't give the arguments, it's going to give you nice help instead of doing something bad like try to execute to an empty version. Or maybe it types like this, you know, you don't know. Or maybe you need to give it a shell argument, uh, environment variable. You don't know. And you can open the shell script and now you're reading 20 years of legacy written by 20 different people trying to figure out what it does and doesn't support. That's really bad. That's a very brittle situation to have when what you want is help output. You want consistency between these tools so that your upgrade SH, your kubectl, and your Gorya stuff all has similar flag interactions, similar argument interactions, um, similar looking help, and where there's deficiencies in these applications like our upgraded SH or Corea, maybe there isn't a prompt for a destructive um, action that you're about to take. You want to prompt before running a command. You want to show a banner warning people about what's happening. Um, and your tools may not have those capabilities or might not have those features built in. And editing them, upgrade SH, you know, you don't want to go there in your, in your first probably six months in the job. And so that's what AppBuilder is. It is a tool to pull together all of these different commands, different CLIs, different um, scripts and stuff that you have lying around into a single single tool. So here's one that I have, for instance. It's called NAT Control. That's how it looks. Here's another example um, to show the capabilities of the service. That's how it looks. You can see they both look completely um, consistent behavior. They behave the same way. You can, you know, see help. You can go into required and you can pass help and you will see um, arguments and flags and required arguments and optional arguments. All of these kind of capabilities that it doesn't have. Um, what I'm doing is calling echo in this in this example. Let's, let's look how that works. I run it. It says I need to give it a name. So I say James. It says hello James. Now I can change the greeting to morning and it says morning James or evening oh no I can't because it has input validations those are the only valid um, greetings that this application supports we can see from help that it would support a and then you know a, a shell override for instance and we can also see from help it has an optional argument surname and now it gives me that and what we can see is it changes its behavior based on what um, inputs are provided. When it's just a name, it will do just, if it's this way, you know, the whole movie will be rough there. Um, and, and what I'm showing is that the way that I'm calling echo is controllable by wrapping it in an app builder. So let's have a look at that. Um, um, so, name. Yeah, it was here. so here we go. Um, Basically, I, I just show from the top, I, a little preamble version, who wrote it, etc. what kind of help I want to show people. 
um, cheat sheets we'll talk about. And now I'm creating my command. So basics, you saw um, sample basics. There's basics. And so, you know, it will help aliases. So I can do um, B if I don't want to type basics all the time. And, you know, here's, here's the stuff that I can do. So the first one called required, which I've been showing you um, so far, um, description. It's going to execute something. It has two arguments. The first one, name, is required to be input. The second one's optional. And it has a flag, greeting. The flag has a short version, so I can do dash dash greeting or just dash g. Um, it has a default value. I can set it from the environment variable, and it will do input validation based on the enum or valid values. Then finally, here's our command that we're going to run. If a surname is given, I do the James Bond stuff. Um, otherwise, I just do hello and whoever. And we can see that greeting comes from um, the flag called greeting. And that's a, that's a concept where you take um, a little command like echo or your shell script or your kubectl or whatever, and you wrap it in these capabilities. And you know, we can do things like um, Confirm. So if my update SH doesn't support confirming before it destroys everything, or maybe I want to print a warning saying, look, you're about to destroy things, you need to do this only during a maintenance window, um, you can add that prompt. Defaults to no, of course, which is a safe, safe default to prevent mistakes. And if I really wanted to, you know, I could do no prompt, and it goes off and does the work for me without prompting. Um, but you, you have to opt into that behavior. And we can also see another another feature here of um, called the banner, where the system will just show you a little text above. Um, that can also be from templates, and so you can say, for instance, if you're looking up a configuration item, you can show the active configuration item. We'll see that in a bit. Um, let's have a look what else we have here. Um, ENV is quite interesting. So if I set a value to foo. Um, you know, it is only present. What this will demonstrate, though, is that if I have my script or a command, you know, which is very typical in, in rake commands, that your configuration required to be set using environment variables rather than flags or arguments. Um, how do we do that? Um, let's have a quick look here. Um, here we go. So I add an argument for my value. I make it required. And I just set it in the environment variable, and then I call my command that I'm going to run, and the environment variable will be set. So the Ruby rake system um, typically takes environment variables as as input, and very hard to discover those, easy to miss, easy to mess them up. You can't find them in help or anything like that. But wrapping them in this, um, you know, you can have extensive help there. You can describe to people what's happening there. You can turn those environment variables into flags and arguments with descriptive, with defaults if not given, all that kind of stuff. It makes using those kinds of systems that's quite um, rudimentary, safe and predictable. Finally, the last major thing I want to show is transforms. Transform is how you take data from one format to another. So, um, you know, when I run this Corea command um, machine state, um, I'm passing it through JQ here to get out um, a nice, friendly display of, of some data. And, you know, back to our Kubernetes example, again, they're also passing things through um, JQ here. And so a transform, let me just do this again, takes data and transforms into another format. Here what I'm doing is I'm using curl to fetch the latest release information for a, a GitHub project. Um, and I'm rendering the release name and the release notes. And I can change this to like, uh, I don't know, um, NATS IO NATS server. Um, there's the most recent NATS server release um, notes. Again, showing that, you know, I have um, um, arguments, optional, of same defaults, passing it to curl, passing it to JQ. Let's have a quick look how that looks. Here's the JQ transform. Um, two arguments, owner and repo, they have defaults, so that's what I think. 
a warning telling me I need internet access. Um, I run the call command and I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting, you know, putting those arguments into the command being run and I'm transforming it through JQ, um, handling the case where someone's put in a repository that doesn't have releases, for instance. Again, making it safe, transforming the data, making it friendly. Let's look at another one. Um, line graph. And this one sometimes fails because of their um, the API that I'm calling. There we go. Um, so we call the, the weather API. And apparently it's not great. Um, I get the most recent I get a, an hourly forecast out of it and then transform using JQ that big JSON document to extract out just the feels like Celsius temperature and then use another transform to turn that into a graph. Let's have a look. Um, I call the API, tell it to give me JSON. I then have an optional caption that I can set, but it has a default. I pass it through JQ to extract a piece of data and then I pass it to a line graph transform to draw the data. Now here these JQ and line graph transforms even though it says JQ you don't need JQ installed in your system. Um, it uses a dialect of JQ called GoJQ which is compiled into the app builder or binary so you don't have to have JQ installed in order to run this command it will work anywhere. Um, and we have the last one is just bar graph. Um, again, I'm interacting with um, the GitHub API with curl. I extract all of the assets for the latest release. I pull out the sizes of those assets and I turn it into a graph sorted by asset size. And I render these sizes as bytes um, because I know these as bytes in this case. And so, you know, run JQ, sorry, run git curl, do some JQ, pass it to a bar graph. We're done. And that's, a, that's, that's the, the point of the system. We're taking commands that exist, You're not writing new commands, just wrapping them in behaviors that either make them safe or augment them with new capabilities. Let's look at the, a real example that I have here. I have a system to operate um, nine NAT servers, and I can do, for instance, um, a servers list. These are, these are the nine machines, and sorry, it doesn't render very good. Um, that I'm operating. We can see it uses a particular configuration item called context here, um, system London. That's looked up from a configuration item. I'm calling a NAT CLI, NAT CLI doesn't support configuration um, of what is the particular one you want to use like that. And so I read up the configuration file and I pass that along to the NAT CLI. Let's see what else we have here. Mem. Again, I'm calling the NAT CLI. The NAT CLI gives me a bunch of JSON data out. I transform the JSON data into a graph. NAT CLI can make graphs. This is an augmentation I added to the wrapper. Um, and at no point do we need to learn the NAT CLI because I promise you, that's quite a lot of work to make that graph. Um, here, I can list the machines that I'm operating. I can see their state. I can destroy all their data. And oops, to destroy all the data is quite scary, so it prompts me. Underneath the tool that I'm calling, Corey in this case, doesn't support prompting you. Um, so I'm wrapping a destructive command that does not a friendly destructive command in a builder and adding the prompt. Um, deploy state. This is um, the version that's currently deployed to my fleet. That is pulled from a key value store. Um, again, you don't even know the details of the key value store, how to authenticate it, to it, where it is, server names, ports, which bucket and key in there, because it's nicely wrapped for you in, in this tool. And the whole thing behaves, you know, really nice, really easy, friendly. Um, there is bash completion if you want to set it up. Um, and in this instance, I'm interacting with NAT CLI. I'm prompting some stuff. I'm you know, just calling some echo in some places. I'm interacting with the Corea CLI. I'm interacting with the Corea discovery system. I'm interacting with a key value store, um, which also happens to be on Corea, but could be somewhere else. Um, there's huge amounts of configuration here because 
key value access as well as one user where system you know listing the servers and memory and stuff like that is another user as an operator at two in the morning i don't need to know any of that details because the system is set up for me and this tool wraps all those complex other apis be it cube cuddle be it bolt be it you know chef knife executions be it any tool you use doesn't matter you can wrap them in this tool um in app builder and fence them around with safety prompts and so forth um, if those tools use widely different configuration models, environment variables, flags, arguments, files, who knows, you can wrap all of that in a consistent interface that brings all of these different tools and different vintages and different lineages into a single tool. And that's the point of App Builder. Um, it's pretty stable at the moment. Um, I do actively work on it, so there's, there's um, some work happening. Um, but I'm thinking we're at a time where it's stable, predictable, and feature-wise, I'm, I'm quite happy with where it is. I probably will not be adding huge amounts of new things to it, um, other than perhaps a couple of other transforms. Um, you can get it on GitHub. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, the Corea IO um, App Builder project, um, extensively documented, um, lots of examples. And you know, download releases. We make it available in um, many different systems and, and formats. Um, let me know what you think about it. And I've used it for a few operations teams, and it really, really helps a lot. Um, come to class on Slack or reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you very much.